Hey, I'm live too. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Hey, it's good, man. It's good that we have not. I can't believe it's been a few. It's like two weeks since we've been able to hit this. It's been a kind of a busy season, I know, with school for you and and uh, just everything going on. But it's good. We got to finish this part. This last was this part five of worship and talking about you know today's sinner's prayer. That's right. We, we, we promised to get there and here we are. So this is the day and, um, you know, it's St. Patrick's day. You think St. Patrick was leading people in the sinner's prayer over there in in Ireland? I don't know. Do you know how old the sinner's prayer is? Does it, does it have Irish roots? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Probably I, I, not. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, that, that brings up a good point. Is there a set sinner's prayer or not? So we'll, we'll just kind of talk through it. I guess we need to open up in prayer. We'll do the Lord's yeah. Prayer. That one is in the Bible. And then we'll just kind of talk about it because people have really strong opinions on this. And I'm not, I'm not that worried about it, but I, I think it'll be a good discussion. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Let's do it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All well, right. Okay. Well, yeah. You set us up, man, because I don't know, maybe for some, they have not grown up hearing or knowing even what the sinner's prayer is. So I think in Baptist churches, especially if you were in a certain generation, uh, you knew about it. And I think there is to some extent a lingering bit of that, but if you were to describe what the sinner's prayer is, how would you yeah, do so, it? So um, in the most basic form, it would be you're talking to someone and they are ready to give their lives to Jesus. They're ready to convert, uh, repent from their sin and turn to Christ, and they don't know what to do. And so you would lead them in a prayer, you know, pray these words with me uh, genuinely to, the, to God and uh, ask them to really invite Jesus into their heart. And, you know, hopefully you're going to include the elements of the gospel there. Um, but, but since there's not necessarily a set sinner's prayer, although you do have set forms of this, I think the Gideon Bible had a page in there. And so you'll find some material there is a sinner's prayer, but most people would just kind of do their best to lead someone into receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, in the context of worship, it would be a little different. Since this is tied to our worship series, a lot of times it would go like this. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed? Mm -hmm. And and the whole congregation goes down. And then if if you would like to pray this prayer, you know, join me now. And the pastor would lead at the end of a, a message, um, a prayer of repentance, a prayer of salvation, and ask people to raise their hands if they have made a commitment, and kind of get them to at least take a step towards. And then the altar call. And of course, if you raised your hand, now you're kind of on the hook to to come forward. And so that. That was also a pretty common practice. I, I'm sure yeah. you do that one every week, right? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, that's what I grew up with too, right? Is the same thing. You, you bow your head, close your eyes. You even hear it still on some, um, on, um, you know, some television preachers, you know, you'll still hear it that, you know, they'll even do it right there, you know? Um, yeah. And then you hear it at, at um, you know, crusades, as well, um, you know, that we want you to, to, to be able to pray these things. And so um, th that's kind of that form prayer, though, right? So, I mean, I just, right, as we're talking, I just uh, Googled it. I was going to look at like typical word choice, right, that you would see. So yeah. here's like, the, this is the Billy Graham one. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. And I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior in your name. Amen. So that was the Billy Graham one. Um, and you can kind of see different forms of that, um, you know, there. It is interesting. I didn't realize this, that, you know, um, it looks like our own, uh, uh, you know, IMB head, Chitwood, uh, has uh, in his, he's kind of dealt with... Uh, the uh, sinner's prayer as well and kind of looking at when it where it came from and uh in that time for us so if you want to look up sinner's prayer sometimes you can just look at and i'm i'm unashamedly looking at wikipedia for that even though i tell all my students don't look at wikipedia but it's a great resource 
to jump into for more, um, you know, don't cite that like I just did, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know, uh, the students that are in between um, terrible and, and decent will just go to Wikipedia and cite all of the footnotes in Wikipedia and put that in their paper and, and bypass mm -hmm. the whole thing. It's like, no, I cited my sources. Um, that, that also is not really good scholarship, but um, I guess here's my, my issue. Leading someone to pray and receive Jesus, I, I think that you have uh, instances of that in the New Testament, you know, from Peter saying, um, what must we do? They say, repent and uh, be baptized. Well, I guess he didn't lead them in a prayer, but that's um, giving them the steps to take. And uh, generally, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans, 9, Romans 10, 9 and 10, um, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth those types of things are what make it into that prayer. And it is the instructions for salvation. So we're just guiding people to, to cry that out to God. So I don't have a problem with this sinner's prayer. I think the, the issues are how people have used it in a manipulative way. And this is, fits in with our worship discussion. And I really would have to say that most of the people that have a problem with the sinner's prayer, I would almost immediately assume they are a little more on the reformed Calvinist spectrum Amen. of evangelical life even evangelical may not even be appropriate there because that it spreads on but yes it's the reformed folks that don't like the sinner's prayer and um you know i i hear their their reasoning for not liking it but i i think generally um i i disagree i i don't think that's that big of a deal but so, I, I will say, I don't like manipulation and I don't yeah. like magic words. So I'll, I'll kick it back over to you. But I will. Okay. So I'll say that as somebody who has an affinity with that crowd, but yet, uh, you know, labels, whatever, what are labels anyways? Um, you know, but I, I will say this, my critique comes from the fact that I've heard too many, I've heard stuff like this. This is a pastor when people are sitting there and you're asking them to share their testimony. Because if you get baptized at Royal Palms, um, we say, you know, one of the things we need to do is we need to hear your testimony, hear how you came to know the Lord. And um, and if you were to join Royal Palms, we need to hear your testimony. We need to hear how you came to know the Lord. And so there have been people before who will say, well, yes, you know, and um, I came down that aisle like we talked about before. I said the sinner's prayer and uh, and I and I, you know, I'm a been a follower of Jesus and my my big critique that I have is I think that we've made it unintentionally um, like that is the set of words that must be used to help people come to follow Jesus that you know the, those who are and I'll say it like this those who are not I you know uh, genuinely saved I think have trusted in a false set of words not that the words are false, but they've said they've trusted in the word, the words as those are the words that are going to save them. Even in, in the same way that someone might say, you know, they take from Romans, confess with your mouth that Jesus Lord, right? That, that whole idea. And they say, well, I've confessed, right? I've, I've done it. I've done my part. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the thing that I get worried about is with people who not from necessarily a reform perspective, but just simply saying like, Hey, I've got people that I know who legitimately think they're saved simply because They've said these words um, and they came down an aisle and that, you know, and, and that might be connected also to what might be another part of that is this kind of easy believism that we've sold people yeah. as well, that you go off and live how you want. You got your fire insurance. So, I mean, that's my big thing is I think sometimes it has become that that's the steps, right? That I get yeah. baptized, I go in the water. I, yeah. but prior to that, I say the prayer. And then I get baptized and go in the water, it, almost as if the prayer is some codified set of what unlocks those power. Not and and some might be thinking of it as an incantation, but I think even people who aren't that who aren't thinking of it in terms of that have sometimes might believe like this is the form, this is what must be said, this is the format. So uh, that's my that's kind of my my frustration that I've had is that it becomes a it kind of gets linked and thrown into there in the same way. Of, I've come down the aisle. I've done this piece. So, yeah. Right. And I, and I think that that's, you know, um, again, the, the reformed perspective is also wants to highlight the reality that unless the Holy spirit has moved and regenerated a person they, they cannot be saved. And so if that hasn't occurred in a person and you validate that they have said a prayer, um, you essentially, um, almost 
lock them into a state of yeah. lostness because they're no longer looking. And I, I think that, again, it, for me, as, as someone who's more on that Arminian side of the aisle, reformed Arminius, um, <laughs> that, that type of re- Arminianism, less uh, Wesleyan, uh, although I, I don't like the labels either because I'm not 100% on either side. Uh, well, if you really believe in the sovereignty of God and that he's going to call and he won't lose any of his own, then who cares, you know, because um, w- we can't mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I get a little bit, you know, you can flip that the other direction. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I don't really um, worry so much. I, I do think, and, and here's the, here's where it's most common. We're going to have vacation Bible school in, a, in about three months. Yeah. And we're going to, if you do Lifeway, you're going to have a song every year. There's going to be the ABC song that they redo in a different yeah. way. A, admit to God that you're a sinner and repent. B, believe that Jesus is God's own son and C, confess your faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. And now you're saved. And even as that prayer goes out, I'm like, okay, well, wait a second. There, there's a lot of gospel that's missing in those three ABCs. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, so you're counting on the teachers to fill in the gaps. But what happens is these kids that grow up in church, they will go to VBS and you will have uh, some wonderful VBS people that one of the days are going to present the gospel and invite the kids to pray. And there will be a certain sense of groupthink that can take place. And you're going to have maybe a zealous teacher that makes sure everyone in their class is going to say that prayer. Yeah. And, and we're going to rack up those VBS conversion numbers. And that can be a hotbed for misuse of something like the sinner's prayer. And, uh, you know, I don't know how you handle that, but what I end up doing is interview each of the children afterwards. And I, I try to get to the bottom. And I, I notice that some st- kids are making a step, but they're not really there. And, yeah. and they, they, they said a prayer because they felt like they were supposed to. They don't necessarily disagree with it, but they haven't really, the spirit hasn't moved and cut their heart and made them grieve over their sin and, and their need for salvation. And, um, and so I, you know, I'm careful. Now, other pastors I know are going to take those numbers. They're going to baptize those kids and we're going to send off to the home mission board, um, our VBS baptism figures. Um, that's, I think, a pastoral position to, <laughs> to work through those things. Uh, I think the sinner's prayer is still a good tool to help because some of those kids are totally ready and, and they're just yeah. needing someone to ask. And some people, adults are totally ready. They just don't know what to do. And it's a very helpful thing to pray through scripture genuinely from your heart and, and help them to, uh, to, to know what the Bible calls them to do and then lead them to do it. So uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with the prayer in itself. But there might be again misuses of it, and on your front, you know, there for Baptists we don't like magic, uh, and so baptismal regeneration that, that when Jesus went into the baptismal waters, he sanctified the waters so that baptism forever and always will save the sinner through the sacrament of baptism. We don't believe that. We believe it's symbolic of what um, of what happens when we are connected to Jesus in His death and His resurrection. But it's more symbolic. It's not magic water. And so we don't want to step back and say, well, there's magic words now. We don't have magic water, but we have magic words. Yeah. And those are the kind of things I think that, that we, we get cautious about. And the sinner's prayer, I think, sometimes gets, um, gets attacked as, as yeah. being a form. No, I, I would agree. And I, like I said, I think it's just one of those things that get misused. Um, and, and I think you're right. I mean, that's a whole nother debate to another time, which is, um, you know, how this is used with children, you know, like with children and, and, and position on baptizing children and all of that kind of stuff. That's for another conversation. But let me let's 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 deal with this, if you will. Walk through this one with me. So let's let's deal with the sinner's prayer. Let's go with by the famous Wikipedia uh, entry of Billy Graham. Right. So, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you for forgiveness. Anything in that that we see wrong or or off to pray or you know to ask somebody to kind of pray through that so far yeah i don't see anything wrong with that i think again we are trying to partner with the holy spirit so if someone is just saying this and is not actually saying it under the conviction of the holy spirit it won't be effective yeah but this is what the spirit will lead you to do he will convict you of your sin so yes and so i think that's important to tell people like yeah if you know that you need to confess that you need to ask for that. And I, and I think there should be something that I think people need to be in, in their own conversation with the Lord need to 
recognize not just a, I'm a sinner, right? Because there's this aspect of like, well, we're all sinners, right? But you're not, let's, let's deal with the depths of your sin and give that up to God. Like that needs to be recognized. So I think there is something to that, that don't just affirm I'm just a sinner, because what that might mean to some is, well, I'm a sinner, but I don't really do a lot of bad things. And the reality is the biblical picture is you're a terrible person and a terrible sinner already um, in your own depravity, that, that there's no such thing as a, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm an okay sinner, right? Or I don't do a lot of bad things. Like you, you need to really deal with what the biblical picture is. And so people need to understand that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's helpful, I think, to go through the law as you talk with people like, okay, recognize we're not just affirming that you're you're pretty much okay, but there's just a few little things that are wrong with you, right? Yeah. That needs to make sure that we can we clear that up with people that we're not just getting rid of some of the little ickies, right? Like all of your sin is an affront to a holy God, and all of it needs to be dealt with before the Lord. And there's yeah, and so I think that's a part of that. And you need to ask for forgiveness for sure. Um, yeah. How about this one? I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I think that's really great because resurrection from the dead is tied to the gospel. And oftentimes that's left out. We focus yeah. on the crucifixion you died on the cross for my sins. Right. Thank you for that. Well, you know, it's kind of sad if the resurrection is not tied to it. So I, I think that that's good gospel material right there. I think that's that. good. Yeah, yeah. Keeping that in there is important, right? Um, I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. What do you think about that line? So turn is good because that's just a, that's what repent means. Yeah. Uh, I think people might get hung up on the word invite there. Yeah. Um, which, uh, again, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I would see Revelation 3.20 and he stands at the door and knocks. So he's the active person here. So yeah. it, it, invite makes it maybe more me centric than it should be. But I, I don't really have a problem with that because you can't be even you can't even be there without the Holy Spirit taking the initiative. If that's so. true. Right. I mean, if if that if. And what I mean by that is if the Holy Spirit is drawing you, then you will bring yourself to that word. I mean, how many times have you said in your own ex Christian experience, Lord, I just, I, you know, I, I want you to take over everything in my life, right? Yeah. And I think that's where he leads you. He leads you to those points where you just come to that position. You say, I just, I need you. Yeah. Now, that being said, though, I think yeah, that where that comes is, I think you're absolutely right. It could be misconstrued as me centric in the sense of saying, I'm seeking you out and I want you to come to me when theologically speaking, we know he has been seeking you the entire time and he's going to indwell you. If you belong to his, he's, he's just going to do that. That's part of being in the new covenant. And yeah. so you're, there's no invitation needed because he already owns you. Um, and so he's coming straight to you, whether, you know, uh, and, and so I think that's a big clearing thing to say, like, and I think that helps for people is to say is, you know, when you ask him into your life, you need to make sure that you understand that that you're asking him to you come is not like he's coming and uh, because you've said it and you can let him out and all of that. Like it's it's his all his work all the time, as you have said. So I think that's a big one that needs to be clarified what you mean by that. And um, and so I know there are a lot of people who get yeah. hung up on the come into my heart kind of a thing, too. Yeah. But again, there is a picture of that at Laodicea. And you can say, well, that's corporate. That's a saved body. And I'm like, well, I think the issue with Laodicea is that many of them aren't saved. Um, and the, yeah. that's why Jesus is knocking on the door saying, let me in. And so there is that opening of the door and participating with the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and when you do that, you realize that it was him all along. So so I don't have a big problem with that, but if, if I was looking for an issue, you know, we could, we could kind of say is invite the correct word there. Yeah. Um, I, I see some value in it as well in recognizing that I am yielding um, to him. And so yeah. uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's part of that gentle uh, pull of the spirit of yeah. God as well. So, okay. Okay. Well, and then I want to trust you, trust and follow you as my Lord and savior. Um. What do you think about that line? It says, I want to trust you. That's what this is the, yeah. yeah. I want to yeah. trust. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and savior. I, I would just take the one to out and say, I'm making the commitment to trust you as my Lord and savior now. So I, I am exercising faith that you, you've given me right now. So one, two there, I could say, eh, um, you could cut that. Uh, the other side though, is uh, I believe, I believe Lord help my unbelief. Yeah. And so that, you know, I see that in the want to. So yeah. uh, I don't have any problem there. You know, I, I would like a definitive 
you know, it, this isn't just me desiring to get saved. I'm actually doing it. I'm giving you my life. Yeah. Uh, well, so comes, I, yeah, I, I mean, this comes back. I think what you said is, I think it's important, right? Is this is a commitment. This is a vow. In fact, I think when you talk about taking the name of the Lord in vain, this is part of what this is talking about, right? Is if you're going to do this and really claim to be a follower of his, taking the name of the Lord in vain means I'm taking it upon myself. I'm claiming to be belong to him and follow him. Mm. And if I take that lightly, if I'm, if I'm truly saying this lightly, then I've, I've blown that commandment. So when you say, I'm going to trust you, you're, you're committing, these are uh, in a sense, these are like vows, right? Yeah. I think maybe that's the better way to say it. these, like, you know, you, you might want to think through how these would be your vow to the Lord of, I want to follow you. I'm going to trust you. I would say this too, that prayers like this should be uttered often by believers, right? Right. Like this should be something that I think this is not a one time. What I mean by this though, is not that it must be offered off constantly to make sure that you're in check with your salvation, but I think belonging to him, there's these aspects should always be part of my walk with him. Like I should be awareness of my sin and his forgiveness I should be thinking about what the gospel means, right? I should be asking him to take over my life completely. And I should be recommitting that I will follow you in all things all the time um, as Lord and Savior. So, um, you know, I, I think that's just something to clear up is you've made a commitment and it's not something I should take lightly. Um, and it's, yeah. it's, you're locked in. You're locked in to say whatever, whatever comes, right? If you're going to invite him, then that means take over everything. And so maybe right. you might want to tweak some of those words for that, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, so far I see nothing doctrinally wrong with this though. No. Um, and, uh, um, and again, I think that they're including some, so, uh, you know, trusting you that's exercising faith, you know, yeah. so necessary for salvation. Um, is that it? That's it. And then in your, uh, in your name, amen. Right. So yeah. I mean, I think, but I think you're right. There's nothing in there that is wrong but the way that it could be used in church could come bad. I, you know, the truth is I would chalk this up to like writing out prayers. And I don't know what your position is on that is right. The written out prayers can have some significance and some meaning. Now, if all I'm going to do is read it off a page. Okay, cool. Like I have a problem, like um, we have uh, these devotionals that we're doing for the church and I really like them. Mm -hmm. Um they're called, uh, you know, seek God for the city. Um, and, but they have written out prayers. And for me, it's hard for me to do those, but I know for some people, uh, it's, it fits because it's showing them like, here's a way that I should try to think about how to pray. Um, yeah. and I think, so I, you know, I think, like I said, in all those things, they can be misused. Um, and you could think I've done it cause I've just read the prayer or is it meant to give you an example of how I should be praying to the Lord about these things? Right. And, and of course, if you, if, you, if you've ever prayed the Psalms, you know, you are praying uh, written prayer. We did the Lord's prayer. Yeah. You know, it'd be fun to do something on the Jesus prayer, which, uh, you know, that's more common um, in, in the Orthodox or Roman Catholic. Uh, but, but yeah. But okay. But I, I do think there's a difference, right? Between praying the Psalms, mm -hmm. because those are words that are scriptures versus this, this is not right. These are our words. This is, I, I, it'd be the same way. Like if I tried to pray, you know, um, I don't know, just something from a church council or whatnot, right. Good stuff, maybe theologically thought through, but there is something different than praying a Psalm out loud saying it. But once again, it needs to become your own, right. There needs to be an aspect of it's meant to, the, the Psalms are the only ones I think you can say those and say it and then let the Holy Spirit work his way through and just make that your prayer. But there also should be a way of notice how he has said these things hmm. and how can I pray these things as well? How can I ask? It's, it's the same way with imprecatory Psalms, right? Yeah. You probably don't want to pray certain things, but you can at least say like, maybe that's not exactly what I want from, for, uh, for this person I'm having trouble with and for their offspring, but I can understand that it's okay to pray my frustration with these people, you know, and so, and, and let that go. Yeah. And uh, again, no, I think there's a lot of scripture in what we just went through and maybe what we ought to do is, uh, you know, put together the, the word for word scriptural um, conglomeration of the sinner's prayer, uh, you know, which would be fun, but uh, you know, it might be a little clunky, 
Um, so I, I guess, but even, you know, even Satan uses the scripture uh, inappropriately. So it still wouldn't safeguard anything um, because people will say the Lord's prayer without any meaning either. Um, and that's a yeah. direct instruction. So, um, well, anyway, the, the Southern Baptist, because this was kind of an issue, they did a, a resolution in 2012 on the sinner's prayer at one of the uh, annual meetings. And so I thought it might be fun to go through this because this is what um, Southern Baptists decided on the issue because it was becoming somewhat problematic. And Eric Hankins proposed resolution, and then uh, a group of men um, came together and, and tweaked it a little bit to make it more acceptable. And I, I'm pretty happy with what they came up with. Um, so you, you want to go through that? Read you read it. Whereas the gospel of Jesus Christ off offers full forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God to anyone who repents of sin and trusts in Christ. And whereas this same gospel commands all persons everywhere to believe this gospel and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. That's Mark 1 15, John 1 12, 6, 25 through 52, and Acts 17. And whereas the scripture gives examples of persons from diverse backgrounds who cried out for mercy and were heard by God, Luke 18 and Acts 16. Whereas the scriptures also give numerous examples of persons who verbally affirmed gospel truths, but who did not personally know Jesus in a saving relationship. Examples there is Luke 22, John 2, and 1 Corinthians 10. Mm -hmm. And whereas empty religion and formalism of one kind, apart from personal relationship with Christ, Christ cannot wash away sin or transform a heart. So empty religion and formalism cannot. Uh, Matthew 7, Matthew 15, John 3. Whereas the Bible speaks of salvation as including both a confession with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and a belief in the heart that God raised him from the dead, Matthew 16, Romans 10. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the messengers to the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in New Orleans, Louisiana, June 19th and 20th of 2012, reaffirm our gospel conviction that repentance from sin and personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are necessary for salvation. Be it further resolved that we affirm that repentance and faith involve a crying out of mercy and calling on the Lord, Romans 10, 13, often identified as a sinner's prayer. As a biblical expression of repentance and faith, be it further resolved that a sinner's prayer is not an incantation that results in salvation merely by its recitation and should never be manipulatively employed or utilized apart from a clear articulation of the gospel, Matthew 6 and 15. And be it further resolved that we promote any and all biblical means of urging sinners to call on the name of the Lord in a prayer of repentance and faith. And be it finally resolved that we call on Southern Baptists everywhere to continue to carry out the Great Commission in North America and around the world so that sinners everywhere of every tribe, tongue, and language may cry out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Luke 18, 13. I like um, that. I think that's I think that's a pretty good um approach to dealing with it and talking about it right because i think that addresses the big the big issue right which is you can't just say the words and live your life right you can't just you can't just claim i've done the prayer but when you say it as we have talked about too as you walk through like if jesus if you're actually telling jesus let me say this you say these things right you better do them right you if you truly are repenting from your sins you better repent from your sins and turn to him uh, yeah. If you're making him Lord of your life, then you better build your life on him. And th those are the things I think those are the criticisms that people say is that you, if you only limit to that, you're you're never going to get to the point of the kind of faith that it takes and the kind of um, kind of commitment that it takes to follow Jesus that he lays out in the Gospels. Like when you really read the Gospels, you recognize that Jesus has never called anybody to a quick hop to it, say the words, follow me kind of a thing. It's yeah. uh, like you be willing to lay down everything in my for me. And uh, it's heavy stuff when you yeah. really actually Down read Jesus' God. words, mm -hmm. following him with your whole life and building your life on him is never to be taken lightly. And it can't be simply I've said I've said some words, you know, so I think that's right. good, man. Yeah, I think that's one of the resolutions the Southern Baptist got right. And, um, and so, you know, and it's, in, it, it's helpful to, you know, the warnings are there. Don't be manipulative. Don't, don't use this apart from a gospel presentation. And I think that's where it really loses track. I, I think one of the places I heard people be critical is, uh, against, um, 
Joel Olstein because he ends with a sinner's prayer and he says, get yourself into a Bible believing church. But a lot of the times the gospel is not always articulated in his message. Some would mm -hmm. argue it's rarely fully articulated because of a direction he's going. And, and many of us at, at preaching on a Sunday, you know, how, how many times at the end of service does someone come forward to get saved and you were preaching on something that was not clearly a gospel articulated message? Yeah. But a lot, a lot of times people know that message They and the Lord moves when he's ready. So I wouldn't say that they're not saved, but it's worth following up and making sure, did they fully understand? Did they count the cost? Did they make the commitment? And was it more than just an emotional feeling for a day? And, and then you, you know, you work through it. And I think a lot of people that walked an aisle later on got saved after meeting with the pastor and yeah. they were taking a step. They didn't know what to do. They were making a movement in the right direction and the salvation uh, quickly followed. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think there's good things. Uh, I, I, I'm a fan of the sinner's prayer yeah. used appropriately. And, and let me just say this. I think the, the other side can be said is you can be saved without never saying these words, right? Yeah. Um, but your conversion must have some form of these though, right? There must be confession of sin. There must be repentance. There must be confession of Jesus and the, re and the point of the resurrection in your behalf. There must be a commitment to following him too. Yeah. Uh, because that's the thing. I think that's the thing that maybe people miss is how much of following Jesus is essential to my salvation, right? Because I think um, if you don't have a strong view of what the gospel is, the gospel saves, right? But the gospel saves and changes you so that you will show your life to be in order with that. And I think that's some of the things when you get into the parable of the sower is one of the points of that, right? Is that there will be people and the word will go out. And, and I'm assuming if we're gonna lift that today, like if, as the word has gone out, and let's say people have all said the sinner's prayer, One's not because the bird's going to snatch that away, but there'll be, I would say there's probably at least two that do say it. One says it and then boom, persecution happens. They're gone. The other one says it and then their life gets caught up with the weeds and they never actually live. I interpret that by the way, there's only one that's saved in the, the sower um, and then the fourth gets it. And they finally show a life that lives aligned with what they have just heard and what they've accepted. Um, so, so, I mean, I think that that's, I think that there could be people, and I think about this, that there'll be people who have picked up a Bible and they've read it and they've got to save them because of their faith in Jesus. And they never verbalized it this way, but all those pieces are there, right? All those pieces have come into place because they've recognized these things. They've prayed these things um, at certain parts in this journey and they're continual as well. Not just, to, I yeah. did it one time, a long time ago. Right. This is the beginning of a relationship and it will, it will blossom and grow. And you'll be saying these things often, especially when you sin and you feel like you've let your savior down and, you know, and, and, and you got to grow in value that Jesus died knowing that you were going to sin following your, your confession and that he died for that in advance. And so, yeah, you grow in that relationship and it's, it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, I, I think I said the sinner's prayer every day of my life, you know, because I was always afraid of, um, losing my salvation growing up. Um, I don't think God was ever disappointed that I kept, you know, getting saved in my own mind, even though I, yeah. I knew I was saved, but I was just always, um, kind of fearful. Um, and, you know, of course, as you grow in your relationship with Christ, that love casts out that fear, you know, and, um, and you mature into that. Uh, so uh, I think especially when you're dealing with children and immature um, believers, there's going to be some discussions about, you know, are you, do you really believe what you confessed? And, you know, let's go ahead and continue. And then you'll have someone say, well, I need to be baptized again. And then you got to work through that. Do you really need to be baptized again? Did you get saved again or for the first time now? Or are you just feeling the spirits calling you into a deeper uh, place? And that doesn't mean that everything prior didn't count. It, it does count. Maybe baptism is not what we need here. What we need is, is just uh, more faithfulness. And so um, that's all pastoral. And I think one of the important things is, is having a good church where you actually do have a relationship with the pastor and, yeah. um, and that'll clean up a lot of these things. Uh, For so, sure. Well, well, one of the things I was going to think as we get ready to close is I just thought of something a little more relevant to this topic, right? Which is, um, I don't know if you 
did you see the recent Babylon B sit down with um, Elon Musk about uh, in how they closed it with him? Did you ever did you ever track that? No, no. OK, so it's it's interesting. Um, they get to the very end and they start to talk about um, the um, they talk about uh, Jesus. I'm trying to figure out where the end of that one is. They, they begin to ask him. And one of the things that they say is like, um, could you do us a solid and accept Jesus into your heart right now? And you're like, wait, what? Um, you know, and there is, there is this, this, um, that's terrible. You know? Yeah. It's just kind of like, dude, what are we talking about? Yeah. So, um, and, and so at the very end though, they, they, um, they like high five and they're like, yeah, we got him, you know? Um, and so they, they, you know, they, they, it, it's very interesting. I'm trying to think about how they go. Uh, yeah. and you know, obviously Elon has, you know, is not there. Um, and he's, he's talking through a lot of these things, yeah. but these guys, just, just for the record, this is a satire site that this is not a real thing that took place. No, it right. is a real thing that took place. I'm, I'm not saying, no, no, this is, the, this is okay. not a satire. Babylon if you B watch joke. the, there's about an hour and 40 minute interview of them sitting down with him because he likes them because yeah. they're, they're not uh, more liberal like the onion. Right. So he okay. liked a lot of them. They actually got an hour and a half sit down with Elon Musk, the two guys from Babylon B. And if you actually go to, it's like the one hour 30, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, minute mark, there is this uh, thing of like, they're trying to get him to say a quick prayer. Like, in fact, um, what is it? Like, uh, he says, uh, they're, they're like, would you do us? A yeah, right here. So here's what the right here. So this is what they say. They say, um, we have, you know, that this is, um, we're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right? And so at the end of that, there's, and so Elon Musk is kind of like going through and talking about like, you know, um, you know, uh, he's just kind of talking through, he's not there. Right. And then, um, and, uh, and they said at the very end, like the minute 35 sweet, he did it. I think we said, uh, you know, uh, I think he just said, yes, we got it. All right. We got him. And that's it. You know, it's, so it's kind of like this is, and that was not a joke, man. It's not a joke, but it's, it's legit. Like they, I think they're part of this, you know, part of that and thing of like, now, if they're just making it a joke, what a weird thing to joke about, right? Y yeah, the, that was richest man in the world <laughs> right there. And you don't give him the gospel, but you ask him to say, yes, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Uh, but yeah, you can watch the full link, the full video. Uh, and yeah. What a disaster train wreck that is at the minute 30, the hour 30 mark. And they just want him to say the words. And then at the end of the mumbling and through is we got him. We did it. Good job, Elon. Not yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, there's just so many problems with that. So yeah, well, I, I'll have to watch that because that's um I'll send you the link afterwards so you can see it. It's it is terrible, but it, I think it's all part of the same vein of well, and if the I thing can is get it, you to say the words. That's poor discipleship. And so I'm not upset at them for genuinely wanting to see him saved. But that is kind of a misuse of, okay, there, there is magic. And if you say it, the Holy Spirit's going to start working on you and we got you. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a friend learning Arabic that had me repeat a phrase in Arabic. And then he laughed at me because it was uh, the, it, it was the first tenet of uh, Islam. And he Goodness. had me profess, you know, Allah is God. Oh man. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I, not for a second, am I worried that I have converted to Islam um, but he thought it was funny, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, God praise the Lord is above that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, yes, but that's, a, that's interesting yeah. observation you make, because I think maybe that is something that, you know, they, I didn't think about it like that, but in the sense of like, not that for some, it might not be, oh, you've said it, you're saved. No, it does seem in that interview they do, but maybe for some it's, you've said it. And this is the, this is the, this is the way to get him to start working towards yeah. saving you is you've said those things. And um, man, that's, it's just scary to think you're right. It's a misunderstanding of the gospel. It's a misunderstanding of, of how you're saved to put your faith in that kind of stuff. Um, 
So needs to be yeah. cleared up. Need you need people need to be discipled in that and understand that that's not sharing the gospel to get them to say it too. Right, and and then you know again, um, I'm I'm reformed at least three days a week. Uh, God is calling people to Himself. God's God's going to get all the ones that that were promised uh, to Christ, the Father. You know, those verses are in the Bible, and we have to just have confidence in those verses, which is is yeah. really a it does make me. Um, much more relaxed that, that I don't have to get them, you know, uh, or else uh, at the same time, there's a significant responsibility that I partner in the gospel that, that God's called us to. And um, it, it, what a blessing when you're, you're, you're part of something. I mean, uh, it is, it is cool. I, I'll tell you the first time I preached a message, I was actually a guest preacher and this little girl came down afterwards and prayed and everybody was just like super excited. They wanted me to announce that she was a sister in Christ afterwards. And I was just, I didn't know what to do because I didn't preach a gospel message, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I was kind of like this buzzkill, I think at the end of this uh, service and we affirmed her and it was wonderful, but I, you know, because I struggled with whether I was saved or not growing up, uh, the last thing I want to do is confirm, you know, you came down. So you're, you're in, um, especially because I was a visiting pastor. You know, my thought is this is, she's taken a step towards the Lord and we're so excited and let's agree we're in prayer with her. But you know what, immediately what I wanted to do was connect her to the pastor sure that that she understood what was going on it was a beautiful thing and i think she got saved i really do but um you know i i've always kind of aired the other direction and let's make sure things are um understood the gospel is really recognized because these little ones in our churches especially they they grow up I, so close um and in in the covenant in some sense um it's a unique unique scenario that the new testament doesn't really even address uh very well uh because it's I don't know. Maybe they do. That'd be a good thing to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> let, let sure. the little children. So, it, you know, what, what we do with that, some people are baptizing as infants. I don't think that's scriptural, but what we want to do is encourage every step those young ones take until they have an awareness of, of what the implications of the gospel are and then rejoice when, when they fully are able to surrender their lives to Christ volitionally. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> I, that, that's a cringe worthy thing. It sounds like, so I'll have to look at that. I guess yeah, we're man. running out of time. You want to you want to close out any other way, thoughts you want to share? Long for sure. Yeah. So let's <laughs> let's finish uh, the way we always do this by uh, doing um, the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter six, which says, "May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace." All right. See you later, guys. Thanks for watching. Check us out here where you're listening or come to the YouTube channel. But um, thanks for being uh, somebody who's listening with us and drop a comment if uh, if there's something interesting you want to interact with on this. Well, God Talk bless and take care. All right.